Hi, good evening. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for Ideas and Action with Reva Lehrer and Molly Crabapple. I'm Christina Gunther, the founder and president of Chicago Cultural Accessibility Consortium, CCAC, and I'm here to introduce tonight's event. CCAC is pleased to partner with One World to make a virtual space for a conversation between two talented artists who use visual and literary art to reimagine the world around them and to honor lives and bodies that are often hidden away or consigned to the margins. CCAC is a volunteer run nonprofit that empowers Chicago's cultural spaces to become more accessible to visitors with disabilities. We are a network of administrators who work in museums and theaters and people with disabilities who work together to make Chicago more accessible. You can learn more about our work by visiting chicagoculturalaccess.org. Tonight, Reva and Molly will be in conversation with One World's publisher, Chris Jackson. I'll now pass the mic on over to him. Hello there. Uh, this is Chris. I'm uh, the publisher and editor-in-chief at uh, One World Books here in New York. I'm really, really excited to have this conversation tonight with um, Reva Lair and Molly Crabapple. Let me quickly introduce both of them. They're two uh, writers very dear to me. I'll start with Molly. Molly Crabapple is an artist and writer in New York. She's the author of two books, Drawing Blood and Brothers of the Gun, which was long listed with Marwan Hisham, uh, which was long listed for a National Book Award in 2018. Her reportage has been published in the New York Times, New York Review of Books, The Paris Review, Vanity Fair, The Guardian, Rolling Stone, The New Yorker, and elsewhere. Her art is in the permanent collections of the Museum of Modern Art. She's currently a 2020 New American Fellow and a 2020 Bard Fellow at the Brooklyn Public Library. And her animated short, A Message from the Future, with Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez has been nominated for an Emmy Award. Uh, and so welcome to Molly. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh man, my pleasure to be here, Chris. Um, and I'd also like to introduce Reva Lair. Reva Lair is an artist, writer, and curator whose work focuses on issues of physical identity and the socially challenged body. She is best known for representations of people with impairments and those whose sexuality or gender identity have long been stigmatized. A longtime faculty member of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, Reva Lair is currently an instructor in medical humanities at Northwestern University. And welcome to Reva. Um, I would say, Maybe not most importantly, but importantly, Reva is also the author of this book, Golem Girl, uh, which just came out last week, uh, which is a memoir of her life um, and uh, and her a story of her of her art and, and journey. Her journey as an artist, um, and uh, it's an incredible book. And I hope you all go out and get a copy of it. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that book tonight. So why don't we actually start there? since that is uh, kind of the occasion for the event. Um, Reva, um, you are an artist and like Molly, both of you have written incredible uh, memoirs as well. Um, what made you decide that you wanted to, to write? Uh, this is your first book and your first really you know, lengthy, extended long form piece of writing. Why did you wanna write? What did you wanna say in words that you weren't saying in your art? Well, um, the book, people have been asking me that, and I think the best way I can describe it is um, if you took a funnel and there were several streams all kind of coming in at once, one of them was that I wanted to make a document for my family. Um, they would eventually be my executors for my work, and I wanted to leave a document that would explain what it was that I did and why. And as I started thinking about doing that, um, what I do is very much about other people's stories. And I wanted to tell the stories of the people that I had worked with. And of course, once you do that, um, you start thinking about your own story and where it started. And I ended up doing research about my family that exploded the whole thing into a different direction, things I hadn't known about my family that really recast what I understood about myself. So all of these things were kind of coming in at the same time. 
and sort of trying to figure out how to make them um, make sense really as one single impetus. Right. And did you feel like there was something in, you know, when I, when I think about your art, I think this is true of, of both of you as artists, I think about your art as being not just um, uh, meditative or introspective or even expressive, um, but it's art that feels like it's doing something in the world. And I think there was a moment probably in both of your careers where you transitioned from artists who were, um, who were creating art uh, just out of you know, an aesthetic drive to artists who were trying to make art that had something to say and that had, I mean, without like making it overly instrumental, but the art that, that was doing some kind of work in the world. Um, and uh, Reva, maybe we'll just start with you. When do you think you, or maybe first of all, let me just ask, do you think of your art as being art that is active, that is doing work in the world? And what is that work do you think it's doing? So um, I've always been a figure artist. I've always been interested in the body and the face and, uh, and understanding embodiment. Um, but what happened was that when I was doing the work that was compelling to me, which was exploring uh, the kind of embodiment that you didn't see in art history very much, people who were very different, um, I was getting so much criticism and pushback from my profession that I shouldn't be doing this, that I'd never have a career, that the people I wanted to depict were ugly, no one would ever buy the work. And I became so determined to not just push through that, but to do it in a way that was effective. So I think the, the negativity and the resistance really came together with the kind of negativity and way that I've been made to feel as a person, that I was the same, that I was, uh, shouldn't be seen, shouldn't be in public, um, was unacceptable. So as I started to make images that um, went into places that I, I at least had never seen before, people with impairments, people who, uh, who deal with stigma all the time, um, it changed how I felt about being stigmatized. And so you end up with this kind of amazing spiral that, you know, as you're making images that your community is relating to and showing you that they really need those, those pictures, um, you're no longer just making pictures. You know that you're affecting people's lives, the people who are sitting for you, but also the people who are seeing it who've always been presented with um, extremely demeaning and damaging images. So I think it was really that. Right, right. And when do you think that happened in, the, in, your, in your, the sort of trajectory of your career? Well, let me actually just pull back a little bit. I'm gonna share something here on the screen, um, which is your work on the circle stories. And maybe you can just tell us a little bit about the origin of this series. Um, while I show some of the uh, some of the art. So uh, I've been in art school twice. Um, yep, that's one of. So I was in art school, and I was still getting a lot of uh, resistance to my doing um, images, mainly about my own life at the time, and um, and I was really in despair. And a friend of mine uh, invited me to join something called the Chicago Disability Arts Collective, which sounded horrible to me and I didn't want to go. And I tried to get out of it, but I had, that particular friend is not someone you can say no to. So I ended up attending these meetings and the people in the meetings, um, they were all people with impairments. They were all people who were either performers or writers and, um, their take on impairment was not like anything I'd ever seen. This was in 1995. And they were funny and they were dark and they were provocative and they were sort of bratty. And there was like no, no pity, no, no like, oh, you know, we're, we weren't special angels whose work was like going to make us better or, or you know, teach people about uh, 
rising above and overcoming. Um, we were people who had, you know, jokes about uh, that one of the people you showed had at my first meeting had told a story about leaving a coffee shop. He was a wheelchair user and having a cup of coffee as he's leaving the coffee shop and it, the lid was off. And, and not for the first time, this guy came up to him and dropped money. I just was so, it's like a door slamming open. So right. as I was sitting there, slamming open. I wanted to do their portraits and that I wanted to do them in a way that was in line with traditional um, technique to speak to art history, to, to really make the point that these are people who had um, been shut out of art history. Uh, it's a complicated thing, but yeah, people with impairments rarely show up in the history of portraiture and right. mostly they show up as victims in religious paintings. Right, right. Um, right, and the, the paintings are, you know, I think both sort of technically um, beautiful, but they also have, uh, they do work in all these different elements of not just the individual that you're painting, but of both their kind of inner life and their almost like, um, mm, <laughs> like their vision of themselves in, in some kind of uh, a way that's not literal. Um, and that happens in collaboration and in conversation with the with the subjects. Yeah, I am um, because of what I said earlier that uh, we had all sort of been presented with this horrible history of freak show images and medical images and poster children and telethons and you know things that just dreadful. Um, and we've all been uh, accosted on the street more times than we could count people saying really horrible things. So I knew that if you're going to draw somebody, you have to look at them for a really long time. And so the act of being looked at wasn't gonna be easy for anybody. So I had to come up with an ethical structure. And as time has gone on, it's been kind of a series. My hands are giant on this thing. Good <laughs> <laughs> Lawrence painting. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I had to really think about how do you work in the studio with somebody for whom being looked at isn't fun? And so it really came to be about giving control and two things, getting someone's story bit by bit, really listening, showing them the image as we crept along, does this comport with your own truth? But also if it didn't or anything bothered them or anything seemed, even if I loved the image, and this happened a lot, that I would come up with an image that I was so excited to paint, but the person I was working with was like, no, that's just gonna take me this other place. And so you had to give up and find something else. So, um, you know, Molly, I was looking at your uh, videos and I know that you had talked about um, when you're in public and you're drawing people or, you know, you're in a lot of, different kinds of places where you're documenting people who might not be, ex aren't expecting to be drawn. Um, and being drawn is a different thing. Having someone draw you is not the same thing as someone taking a photograph. I think it feels much more intimate and it's a much longer look than A hundred percent. I mean, that's, that's, that's why they say that you, make a drawing but you take a photo yeah. and also in a certain sense the person has to give a sort of consent to be drawn right because if they don't want to be drawn they can just kind of get up and leave and then you don't have any more drawing of them um it's a very very different thing than um the dynamic that a lot of photographers do is where they go to some place perhaps where you have people who are poorer than them wearing outfits they find picturesque and then they come and they like snap 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 and they take away the image and then they sell it later um what i always wanted to do with my art was i always wanted to do well, well as as you said i always wanted to create images um that were in collaboration with like tough brilliant people who 
you know, might have been shoved off at the margins. Um, and what you said to me also about about like dark humor, right? And the the impiety of the group. It was something that really resonated with me. Um, my last book I did with an amazing uh, Syrian writer who named Marwan Hisham, who's oh dude, he's like one of my best friends and also one of the most the champions of gallows wit. But you know, Marwan he stayed in Raqqa after it was taken over by ISIS. He stayed through the beginning of the American bombing campaign. And um, then later he left. And when we would hang out, he would always tell me that what he hated was he hated the way that people would talk about Syrians. They would talk about them either as like terrorists or, you know, which is one thing, but even worse, they talk about them as these pitiful, helpless children that just needed, you know, some Western NGO to tell them how to pull up, pull up their own pants and tie their own shoes because they were just that helpless and stupid, you know? They just needed sort of a hug and some instruction from the West. And um, when we were working together on Brothers of the Gun um, and when we were um, doing the art for that, and that art was just as collaborative as the writing was, we wanted so much to fight back against that. We wanted to create pictures that were as rich and human and fraught and, and complicated um, as any person deserves to be portrayed. Yeah. You want to get the, not just the facts, you want to get the sort of miasma of life. Exactly. Miasma. The other thing that like really, when, when I was- Yeah, and you know- was gonna, other, like, okay. No, please go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Um, when I was looking at your work, Riva, um, there's not a lot of people now that have the chops to draw like you do. In, in addition to drawing, um, you know, people with disabilities, right? People with impairments. The other thing that's unusual about the work is that you draw like a classicist. Like you draw like someone who can actually draw and paint, you know, um, which isn't something that necessarily is super prized and certainly was not super prized in the nineties, um, but it's something that I love. And it's like what I think the best art is. Why did you choose to do stuff that's that's figurative? Because people people will ask like me that, like why, you know, why did I um, do this sort of illustrative work as opposed to I don't know doing some sort of abstract swirly swirls? But what, why did you do why did you do figurative work? Well, when I, was, I started school in the seventies, and being a was like I may as well have decided to um, I don't know go be a fur trapper in death. <laughs> burn the witch, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, you know, but, you know, I, I grew up in the hospital and as I've written and talked about, I didn't come home till I was two and then I went back again and back again and back again and my mother kept me inside a lot. And it's not that I never went outside, but, um, in the most emotional parts of my life, the places where I was the most vulnerable usually, I was in small rooms with people who were bigger than me and older than me and in control of my body. And I felt like I had to understand faces and I had to understand language and I had to understand um, just the whole path. Like I'm very, very aware of body language and I've studied body language and I think that when something really is imperative to your survival, you just become really sensitive to it. Mm. And, you know, when I started school and people were doing still lives and stuff, I was like, okay, you know, I need to learn how to do that. You, you do need to learn how to draw things other than people. But it seems so pointless. Like, I've never been somebody who is in love with formal um, considerations. I have my own, but I want to make work that um, is worth giving your life to. And there's a lot of work out there that I don't understand that that's how you're spending your life. And it's not that I think that the work has to be political, but it seems to me so often that if that work didn't exist, sucks okay but <laughs> i know that work needs to exist and you know it's not always figurative but very often very often 
is figurative because you know we are we, our bodies are our primary language. One That's of my good. I'm sorry. Please go ahead. One of my good friends he once told me that um, you know that something is art if the apocalypse happens and then. 800 years later, someone digs it out of the ash and they feel wonder at it without mm -hmm. knowing any of the context, without knowing, you know, where it came from, but they just look at it and they see something miraculous. And I feel like, you know, figurative work and like really good figurative work, it does that. It's the language that communicates the cross time. It's not something you need to go to art school for. It's not something, you know, you need a PhD for. It's something that even if someone very different than you sees that thing held in the streets or sees that thing in the rubble of a bombed out building, they know it's something real. And um, I love what you say about art that's worth giving your life to. Yeah, and just on that note, um, Molly, you know, I think just as Riva was describing, like having a, a moment of transition as an artist, you know, where I think she found her subject, um, which I think the book, if you read it, captures very well. Like a, there was a period where, you know, Riva was obviously doing amazing or interesting work, but still trying to find the thing she wanted people to see and the thing that she wanted to convey. Um, and did you have a similar sort of awakening having read your memoir? I know that there is one. Um, <laughs> Spoilers. Awakening to uh, sort of like what you felt the purpose of your art was. I did, yes. Originally, I uh, got my start as a young artist who was totally obsessed with uh, Toulouse-Lautrec and Moulin Rouge and the nightlife of late 1800s Paris. I saw those nightclubs as both like kingdoms of ultimate glamour and also stages of class war. And all I wanted to do was hang out in nightclubs and draw the amazing, jagged, tough, and like really sexy and glamorous people that were performing there. That's all I wanted to do. And when I was 24, I was able to do that. I uh, talked my way into a very fancy nightclub and I spent some years sitting on the corner of the stage most nights and watching as people did backflips over fire and uh, watching as, you know, beautiful naked women did cruel parodies of the wealthy customers. And, and that was my life and it was amazing, right? Um, but through doing this, I, I had dropped out of school and I always felt like, okay, this is what my art is. You know, I can draw like beautiful, beautiful women and I can draw a luxury and I could draw like frills and ruffles, but I didn't feel like I was uh, clever enough or good enough to do anything like serious and nothing, and nothing to engage like the present and, and uh, sort of the, the larger world outside of, outside of this club land paradise that I like to chronicle. And then uh, Occupy Wall Street happened and the other uprisings of 2011. And Occupy Wall Street happened basically outside my window, maybe a little bit down the block for accuracy. And immediately, as soon as I came down there, I was like, no, no, I got to draw this. And I got to throw out all the ruffles and all thr the frills and all of the ways that I would hide in the costume of the past because I want to draw the present because the present is raw and bloody and beautiful and cops are beating up my friends on the street and I can hear people screaming from my window uh, chants against the wealthy bastards that destroyed the world and I want to capture that all right and so um, when Occupy happened that was when I started using my art not just to document my friends and not just to document beautiful things but to also um, document uh, protest um, revolt and eventually uh, prisons and, uh, and war as well. Yeah, and, um, and you know, I think your art was so, like when I think about Occupy, I think about your art, when I think about the Women's March, I think about the, the pieces that you did for that. Um, what have you been doing lately? This year has been a, an eventful year. Um, <laughs> and um, what, have you felt compelled to, to document uh, what's going on around us right now? I have. I did uh, two projects that are more topical this year. The first was when everything just started and we we're first like locked in our homes and when, you know, like 1,000, 2,000 people a day were dying in New York City. I, um, I had this idea that I just wanted to like 
I just wanted to do portraits of essential workers. And I didn't just mean essential workers like nurses, even though I, I drew plenty of portraits of nurses, right? Um, I met essential workers like uh, the train driver or the, the garbage man or the, you know, the chick that works at the grocery store. Um, basically all of the people whose labor keeps the earth running. And um, I, uh, I went on Twitter and I was like, yo, if you, you know, have a job where you can't take off from and you want me to draw you, just like send me a selfie in your work clothes and I'll do it and I'll send you a print. And I ended up drawing, I want to say over 70 people from all over um, the country, every type of person I drew guys that worked in Amazon warehouses. I um, drew like um, older women who worked in dollar stores, you know, in the Midwest. I um, drew a couple that owned an ice cream shop that turned it into like sort of an emergency food distribution place. And I drew and I drew and I drew. Um, and for me, that was just like one, wanting to pay tribute. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to document these people. And my favorite was um, my friend, my friend Rosa, Rosa Clemente, uh, her, her partner, uh, Justice, he's a janitor at SUNY Albany. And I have this picture of him and you can't really see much of him because he's wearing like a mask and gloves. And um, I wrote uh, this uh, line from this uh, famous Puerto Rican poet, which is um, Gloria, Sa uh, sorry, Gloria a las manos que trabajan, uh, glory to the hands that work. And that was my, my sort of workers, my workers tribute thing. Uh, the other thing that I did was when um, the uh, Black Lives Matter uprising kicked off, I just started going into the streets and taking as many photos as I could and then um, drawing from those photos. And I have like a bunch of sketches that I've done from then. Some of them I published in the New York Review of Books. I, I don't know, some, some of them, I don't know, don't you ever just like you get greedy, right? And you just want to draw the world because it's in front of you and you don't even necessarily have like a professional project. You just mm -hmm. want to, you just want to draw it and, and, and get it down and try to get it as like true as you can. Um, I have a bunch of, a bunch of sketches that I've begun from the last night at the city hall encampment before all the NGOs came out when, um, or before all the NGOs pulled out when these like these teenagers, they built barricades and behind the barricades, they built more barricades out of their bikes. And behind that, they had girls with their arms linked up wearing helmets. And behind that, they had a dance party. <laughs> to, and it was, it was one of the most beautiful things that I've ever seen. It had so much just like crazy idealistic youth. And I want to, I want to do some drawings from those sketches, but I haven't yet. Hmm. That's really great. Um, but I just want to throw out to the to the audience that uh, you should feel free to put questions in the uh, I think the Q and A rather than the chat, um, and uh, we'll entertain some questions at the end. Um, Riva, I just want to talk to you about like this past year and what it's been like um, for you as an artist, uh, particularly as a portrait artist, um, and how you've been able to, uh, and also as someone who you know is. Uh, in a sort of vulnerable population as we've gone through this uh, dire time. I think, you know, one of the things I, one of the many things I love about your book is um, the way we, the, you know, adapted the ending to the, to the present situation. And you had, I thought, some really powerful things to say. Um, but also, I'm just curious about how, how it's been for you as an artist. Well, I was lucky in the beginning because I had a um, couple of portraits in process, although in both cases, uh, it was <clears throat> they were of people who were supposed to come back and sit for me some more. I've been actually trying very hard the last few years to move away from using photographs. Um, my work is much better if it's uh, based mm -hmm. on uh, not only live sitting where I'm really challenging myself to see what it is that's right in front of me right that minute, but also because um, the intimacy of the studio, what happens when I'm alone with a subject and we're telling stories in our lives, um, that's just as transformative for me as what happens when the image is done. I, I've often said that what drives me crazy about museums is that you see this portrait on the wall and it'll have a tag, oh, it's by so-and-so and here's the date and there's nothing about how the artist felt about the subject, how the subject felt about the artist, 
what, what polydynamics <laughs> were. I mean, most of, most of those are commissions. And, you know, I've also often thought that it's like being a sock puppet. I don't do commissions almost ever because mm. you just turn into this, like, I want this and I want this and I, and I, and I don't get me started. I <laughs> <laughs> not have dolphins in Lake Michigan. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not kidding. Um, and so I had worked really hard on having this kind of immediate, intimate, you moved. Okay, sorry. People are like, I'm bouncing mm -hmm. up. Um, and then, so I had these two portraits in process, and one of them was of someone who's featured really heavily in the book, was my college boyfriend, who I've known for 40 something years, and he had come in to sit for me. And it was this whole celebration of knowing each other for 42 years and everything we'd been through, you know, as lovers and then friends. And, and uh, he spent the weekend and it was just fabulous. And he was going to come back and we were going to, I should back up a minute. One of the things I've been doing in the studio, which is also really important about why I try not to do photographs, is that I'm very interested in the ethics of the studio of like the power dynamics you know what if i'm drawing you in the end i'm responsible for what you look like you're handing over your faith in me you know that i can really see you and whatever i'm going to produce is going to make you happy and make you feel seen but it's a risk right i'm they're not photographs i'm always off in some way and so knowing how vulnerable it is, um, I wanted to really give people even more control than tell me your story. So what I've been doing is this project called The Risk Pictures. And with that, I invite people, we set up a schedule of sittings and each one's three hours. And then at two hours, um, I walk out and I leave people completely alone in my apartment and they've done all kinds of interesting things, uh, you know, <laughs> I try not to count my objects when I come home. Uh, you know, eating things, slept in my bed, going on my computer, and things that I. But the thing is, I I don't ask. They're in charge of my life while I'm gone. But in exchange, they have to alter their portraits. They have to go into the studio and draw, or write, or collage, or tear, or something. You know, burn it with cigarettes. I don't know. But they have to take responsibility for their own image for that hour. And then we do it over and over. So I was in the middle of this with William. And then I was also in the middle of this with uh, the novelist, Achi Obejas. And kaboom, here comes the iron curtain of the virus. And so first, what I had to do was find ways to ship them, pieces of the portraits. This stuff is now on my website, the, the finished pieces. I was shipping them pieces that they could like do something to ship back to me. It was not easy. And then I had to figure out how to attach it or there were different techniques. And that took me a few months into the pandemic. And then I started to panic because I couldn't invite anybody else in. Hmm. And it's dangerous for me to be out. I mean, I'm, I do go places because I have to, I don't have an assistant. And so I have to do some of my own shopping and stuff, but like, I can't go to the protests. It's if I get the virus, that's the end of me. So, um, and just physically, I can't carry a studio kit where I go. I've never been able to do plein air stuff, Molly very much at all, because I can't, I can't carry the supplies with me. Um, so everything has almost always been in my studio. So the way I've been dealing and feeling, first off, being disabled right now is a nightmare in that we're being told over and over that we're disposable. I mean, not in metaphoric ways, explicit. You know, it doesn't, like this whole thing now about herd immunity, let's take all the vulnerable people and, you know, you know, Put them in prison. You know, they, they got the children out of the cages. Maybe that's where we're going next. Um, but yeah, you know, shove them away. And then all the healthy people can come out and I don't know what. And 
But clearly it's not about valuing us as part of the world, even valuing our health. It's just like, well, let's, you know, those annoying people who are causing problems by getting sick and dying, let's just get them out of the view. And they were told about resource restriction and medical care restriction and supply guarding and 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 so many of my friends are in, are just as vulnerable as I am. So here we have this time that there are all these protests, right, in the streets, people demanding their rights, demanding to be seen, and we can't freaking do it. So, I mean, there are times, I'm not kidding, it was right outside my door. The parade was coming down my street and I couldn't go out and join. And it felt awful because I'm a very political person. So I had to figure out two things. One is it's more urgent than ever that we stay visible and right. life's work. So how was I gonna do it? So what I'm doing right now, I'm doing a few things, but mainly I'm starting to work over Zoom where I have somebody sit for me multiple times and we do the same thing we do in my studio, which is tell stories, but I draw them over Zoom and it's really hard because you can't see very well and there's no dimension, but it's its own language. Like I accept that this is what things look like, like right now, so I'm looking at everybody on the panel. I can translate you in my, I mean, Chris, I, I've seen it a bunch of times. I can, I can imagine. <laughs> 3D <laughs> um, but it's like I'm it's like getting 30% of a person but the last thing I'll say is just that all portraits are fragments anytime you depict somebody even if it's a movie that is two hours it's only going to be a little piece of a person and Molly you know that doing a drawing of somebody you're getting like a fleeting fraction and you're trying to make it represent who this person is in one image that isn't like so essentialist that it just becomes a cartoon symbol of a person. And so I feel like in a weird way, like as I'm looking at you guys out there and everybody who I can't see, I'm constructing you in my head out of fragments. Like I'm just doing a more extreme version of what portraiture always is which is you get a little bit of information, you try and figure out what's important, what needs to be said. And you do your best to have that be something that in 500 years when the bomb hits my bill, <laughs> it's worth picking out of the rubble. Yeah, you know, there's a, there's a, I told you I wasn't gonna ask you to read anything, um, Reva. You lied, huh? But if you have the book handy. Um, I just happened. <laughs> Great. Um, there's just a, a very short passage, though, that I, it's just made me think of. Um, and uh, it's just, it's weirdly, it's from the epilogue, but it doesn't give away anything in the book. Um, but I think it really does speak a lot to this idea of, you know, like you were saying, like this, this um, necessity for being seen. And I think this is so true in both of your art. I think about the book I worked on with Molly, which was about the Syrian civil war. Um, that were, there were no images from what was going on in ISIS-occupied Syria, except for these cell phone photos that Marwan, uh, her collaborator, was able to sneak at great risk um, and get to Molly so Molly could represent them and that we could see them. And there's such, it's so important um, to be seen. And I think those protests um, that you've both spoken about were, uh, I guess, such an incarnated version of that people, you know, the necessity for being seen and how powerful that is. Um, but I think there's also the power is that it, it, I think through being seen, you know, I think people also see value and which is why sometimes people try to hide, you know, and incarcerate and bury, you know, and, and um, house in various ways, the things that we don't want to ascribe any value to. Anyway, so um, Reva, if you don't mind, just um, really just that la those last uh, three paragraphs of the book in your epilogue, if you don't mind, on page 370. And then we're gonna turn it over to some uh, questions from the audience. Starting with what I saw or? Yes. 
Okay, so just going to back up a little bit, talking about disability as a bottomless well of ingenuity and creativity. I saw this ingenuity play out on social media as soon as coronavirus dominated our lives. My able-bodied friends were apt to share political posts and medical information about the virus, while my disabled friends, by and large, went straight to the daily practicalities. How do we get groceries now? What do we need to have on hand? Who is out there to help? They were used to the strategies of survival. If we must argue for our worth, then this is worth incarnate. Let me step back a moment from my anger and my sense of betrayal. I ask you to think about the people I've written about in this book. Perhaps they've changed how you see the world, made more space for you who are, made more space for who you are and for those you love, unveiled the depths of human flexibility. We must not be shoved back to the eugenics horror of 80 years ago. We together, must not lose all we've gained. And so now I say, sometimes the monster is the one who saves us. It takes a monster to face down the dark. Thank you for that. Um, and um, I'm going to uh, now go to a couple of questions we have from our audience. Uh, first one from uh, Marcus Hoffman. Um, and he says, beauty is such a central term in art. So I'd love to know how Riva and Molly would define beauty? Thank right. you, Mark. It's an easy question. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's simple. Define beauty for us, please. Um, I always think that all attempts to create a universal standard of beauty, uh, first off, they'll, they'll just be false. And second of all, they're usually tied into something pretty evil. Um, I think that beauty is, what is it? Beauty is like porn. You know it when you see it. Um, I, there are things that my hand wants to draw, right? Like my hand wants to draw curves. It wants to draw details. It wants to draw like, you know, what a woman looks like when she's doing a backflip or it wants to draw like what red fruit leaves look like. And there's stuff that doesn't want to draw. It does not want to draw any minimalist perspective, you know, clean lined thing ever. And I think a lot of perhaps my own uh, personal definitions of beauty, they come out of that. Um, I suppose instead of beauty, I like to think more of what I want to accomplish with my work, which is to show people a world that is uh, richer and more complicated, more complicated above all than um, they ever thought possible, more marvelous maybe. Not in the sense of being nice, but in the sense of marvels. Right, right, that's beautiful. Um, beautiful. Uh, Riva? Um, I finally came up with a definition of what beauty is in terms of people, the, the beauty I'm looking for in my portraits, which is that when you are different, when you're stigmatized, if you're queer or your ethnicity is not like you're in a surrounding where you're not surrounded by a lot of people like you and you're, you're targeted or you're disabled or whatever it is um, that gets you singled out. Um, if that happens to you a lot, you start to really become very aware of what you look like, what you move like, what people think you are, um, and what your body needs, what you need in space and in society in order to survive. And there's this way that for me, people who have really had to struggle with their public um, existence get this kind of really lived in body, like this really conscious occupied body that I don't see often in people who have very, very normal, it would seem like normal presentations where they really never had to confront being um, scrutinized and judged all the time. And I find that there's something thrilling. I can just see it and it's thrilling. This this sense of intensified presence in somebody who lives that way. That's like a dancer or an athlete, except it was inflicted on them. No, but it's the same. Yeah. Dancers and athletes have the same thing, but it, it is more complicated, but there is absolutely a very similar spark. And it's one of the reasons I love dance so much. I'm not a sports fan, but mm. I love dance. 
and a lot of it is that. Yeah, that's really wonderful. Um, here's not a question, just a word of thanks to Reva um, from one of the uh, viewers here. Some of my close family members use wheelchairs and your portraits call them immediately to mind. I love to the idea of sitting subjects participating in their own depiction in some way. Um, and I do think that's one of the really distinctive things about, about what you do is having that kind of sense of collaboration. Have you ever had a case where the collaborator isn't happy with the end result or where you have allowed them to participate in the art and you've hated what they've done? Uh, yes, and also yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I had, yeah, I had one person tell me that I had depicted her in a way that made her look too old and too Jewish. And I'll <laughs> the famous story about Picasso's portrait of Gertrude Stein where Oh, I forget who it was that said that she was complaining about it, that it didn't look like her. And, and uh, the person responded, um, you will, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, it's not that I've hated what somebody, I did in the moment several right. times, hate what somebody did. But I've come to really love that because it made me really cope. Like if somebody does something the big problem really has been that um, a lot of the people I work with are masters, um, ninjas, what if some non-sexist word, <laughs> experts at what they do. And a lot of their sense of self and their ego is tied up in this deep accomplishment. And so I get them in the studio and I say, okay, here's a crown. And they're like, oh, you're the artist, I don't know what to and so sometimes people have been so timid. And I'm like, just with the crown, I just do it. I'd really rather have somebody get in there and challenge the hell out of me than be like, oh, this is so pristine and sacred. I must not do anything to it. So yeah, you know, it's been times I've been appalled and then it's turned into something way better than I could ever have expected. Hmm. Molly, have you ever had that experience with someone who you've, because uh, you've done some portraits as well. Um, uh, oh yeah, um, I did a, a series. It, I was not quite as brave as Riva was um, in that I uh, did not leave my apartment when it was happening, but I did a series called Annotated Muses where um, my friends could do whatever they wanted to with these giant paintings that I had done of them. And these are like very, very close friends of mine. and. Uh, the paintings, they incorporated like hundreds of little drawings I had done, then I drew a big picture of them. And a lot of, you know, these friends, they were like sex workers, they were models, they were people who were very used to like, you know, being being looked at and um, be, being sort of tools for someone else's vision. And I wanted something where they could talk back. And yeah, I, one of my friends, he um, he's anonymous and I painted him, I painted him naked. And then he, and I did a really good job on his face. And then he took like gesso and he just like blotted the whole thing out because he's like, people, I don't want people to see my face. I'm anonymous. I'm keeping my pseudonymity, pseudonymity here. And one part of me, I was like, I was like, oh my God, look at all of those hours. Those hours have been lost. But then the other part of me, so I really feel like any mark, if done with sufficient swagger, is a good mark. <laughs> and he had such swagger the way that he like completely effaced um, his face that I, uh, I liked it. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I've, I've had a million people say they didn't like my drawings. I mean, I draw a lot of women whose job it is to be like beautiful and looked at. And because of that, they're incredibly picky and they think I made their nose too big and they think I made them look old and they want to kill me. And they, um, you know, they, they, they think I did something vindictively and why did I make their arms so thick and blah, blah, blah. And um, I just kind of, it kind of goes with the territory and um, sometimes they're right. Sometimes they're not right, but I tend not to put out anything into the world that people really hate, unless they're a bad person. If they're a bad person, I mean, I'll, I'll draw things people hate. Like I drew, I drew in Guantanamo Bay and I drew, um, you know, military people that like work on the prison and I was, they didn't have any consent in how they were drawn. <laughs> that, that, they didn't get to choose that. Right. Um, all right. So uh, Riva, uh, a question for you. Um, how does the story of the golem relate to artistic production? You've spoken about disability and embodiment, but I wonder about the part 
where the golem was created by someone else and enlivened by magic or mystery of God and or the supernatural. Um, so you write, you write about this in the book. Um, you sort of flesh out the, the metaphor, but. Is that, I should flesh out the monster right now? Or? <laughs> no, just, just you know, answer however you want. Uh, well, the relationship of the golem to the book and to the story is that, um, so I've had, I, if I say this, I'm not trying to medicalize my story. My book is not a medical travelogue. It's not about enduring lots of, it's not about enduring that. Um, but I've had, I think, 46 surgeries now. And the reason I mention that is that my body's been redefined since I was born. Changed and changed and changed and changed and changed. And there's still chances it'll be changed again um, if I survive the pandemic. And there's a way that uh, you become um, not exactly detached, but um, I'm just, my form is, is never permanent. And I know that. And so I feel like a creation. That's the first thing is I feel like I was created and built and sculpted by lots of doctors and their scars all over my body. And I think of them as the signatures of all of my sculptors, literally. And so the first level is just what it feels like to be created and then to be told that you are um, deformed, ugly, should be different, should walk different, should look different. My body has always been seen as a failure in a lot of ways, a success in that it survived, but a failure in that it should have been something else. And the golem, when the golem is built, it's to save, uh, so the story is that um, Rabbi Judah Loewe ben Betzalel, who's a 16th century wonder rabbi in Prague, uh, hears that there's going to be a pogrom of peasants, peasantry, whatever, uh, Cossacks, who are gonna come and attack the Jews of the, of the sort of Jewish, sec, uh, Jewish sector of Prague. And um, this would happen on a regular basis, but this was supposed to be particularly brutal. So he prayed on what to do about it. And he got this vision that he should go down to the riverside <clears throat> uh, the Vlatva River and build a monster. And so he brings the, and that the monster will protect the Jews. And so he builds this thing and he puts mystical words in its mouth and he puts the word for truth on its forehead. And the monster rises up and does the rabbi's bidding and rounds up all the peasants and the Cossacks and, the, and puts them in jail. There are different versions of this or a lot of versions of this, but this one I'll say puts them in jail. But each time it comes back, it's bigger and it's less able to be controlled. And finally, the monster is having its own feelings, its own desires. In some versions, it's starting to lust for the rabbi's daughter. Um, in some versions, it wants to be incorporated in the, um, in the synagogue. It wants to start learning and it wants to be part of the, of the minions. I, like a lot of different versions. But it no longer is there just to you know, do the rabbi's bidding. And so the rabbi tricks it to bend down because it's so big now that the rabbi can't reach its head anymore. So he tricks it to bend down and he goes like this and he wipes off the first letter of Emmet. And so what you're left with is dead, dead met and the, the monster falls down into a heap of mud. And so I was thinking all of the stories in our culture of created beings, whether it's Frankenstein or Mr. Data or, you know, a million robot stories. And they're always built for somebody else's purpose, right? And if they start to experience hubris, it's an enormous threat. And usually then it's disassembled or killed or something. So when I was born and I was saved by all this surgery, I was born into a society that had no use for me whatsoever. Um, kids like me were institutionalized. Uh, 
if we even lived that long. A lot of times we weren't even operated on because the idea was that enjoy the baby while you have it, the baby's gonna die. And if the baby survived, then it would go into an institution. And we weren't destined for jobs or careers or college or marriage or families or anything visible whatsoever. A lot of us, I've done some research, um, a lot of kids never even made it to institution. They'd sort of be up in somebody's attic or back bedroom or something. And we never saw them. You know, it's like the Kennedys with their disabled, you know, I can't remember what the Kennedy sister's name was, but no one ever saw her. She was an, she was institutionalized. She, I believe she had Down syndrome. And so there I am, I'm this monster, I'm this deformity that's been saved for nothing. And so the purpose that I served was to let science figure out how to move forward and because my parents loved me. But other than that, I, I and my generation, for the most part, did not, were not born into a place where we could have our own purpose. We were there because somebody else decided we should be there. And then that was a, a dead end road. All right. So. And how does that connect though to, um to you as a creator, having become like being both the created and now through your art, a creator? Well, I think of myself first off as a monster that has um, not just had to invent my purpose, but that I see this in the lives of a lot of people around me, but also that monsters are very interesting. They often open up spaces of permission to think about something that's um, unspeakable or hard to grapple with. And they're, the main thing they do is they violate boundaries. This is what I love about monsters. They're always a conflation of at least two states like human, animal, human, uh, robot, life, alive or dead, or, you know, something like that. And then the way they act violates boundaries, like they slime and they spit and they bite and they, you know, mystically beam little things <laughs> at your brain. And so that's also something that people think disabled people do, that we are infectious, that we're a threat to have around, that somehow being around us um, is going to um, compromise the health of the able-bodied. And so I want to be in that space. I want to make pictures and live a life that um, in my own quiet way, just keep saying, no, the boundary is where the power is, where the beauty is, where the shock is. I'm queer. And the thing that has really been hard in the last few years with um, uh, marriage equality is that as we became possessors of um, an official right, we also at the time lost a lot of our ability to question and shock. We became domesticated and normalized and you know, much less able to bring into question the, the tropes of heteronormativity because we were, we're purchasing them at Target and I don't want that. I, I think the monster state is so much more useful. Yeah. I have a question for you, Reva. Sure. What's another future for the Gollum? One where the rabbi isn't able to wipe um, the Aleph off his head. One where he gets to grow bigger and bigger and more uncontrolled. Have you ever thought of that? The other way I could have gone with the Gollum? The Gollum became voracious, but not voracious. In, in the stories I've read, where in that period be, before he's destroyed, he's feeling all of these powerful feelings, like love and curiosity and lust and the desire to join humanity and questioning what it means to exist. And he's just this whirlwind of like, um, what, why, what, why, what, why? And I like to think of like a monster who just becomes this like 
entity of questioning, like <laughs> whatever he encounters, she encounters, is like must be questioned, must be turned upside down and asked, why is it this way? And, you know, am I part of this? Am I not part of this? I think that that's thrilling. Yeah, I don't you know, think to it. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of questions in the, this is a really interesting, I think, um, segue, because there's a couple of questions about about museums, about where art is shown. And um, and I know, Molly, um, that there is a relationship between your art and um, and street art um, and the kind of art that just is, even in this period of pandemic is sort of all over, you know, downtown Manhattan and Brooklyn is art everywhere. You know, now I think a lot of it came out of, um, you know, the people in the street during the protests. Um, where, and this is a question for both of you, because this is a question uh, here in the chat, would be the ideal place to see your art? Like if you were, first of all, is there a museum or even an outdoor space or, a, or an ideal space to see art for you? And where would be the art, ideal place for your art to be seen? In someone's home, in a, on the street, and where? Are you I mean, I think like I think one of the problems of the world now is that art has been so confined, you know, to special art spaces, which means that the rest of the world is a non-art space where there should be no art. You know, art needs to be like a dead butterfly, right, in the art space. So I, I tend to be a believer that art should be everywhere, um, from you know, scrawled all over walls to written um, to graffitied inside library books to um, something that you see when you pull up some carpeting to. Um, Yes, in museums and galleries, to on packaging, to on posters, to everywhere. I mean, but for me, um, one place that I, I love is uh, Santorce, which is like kind of like the artist hipster neighborhood in San Juan. And it has some of the most stunning street art in the world and like mean street art too. Like, I mean, all like, you know, when you're a colony, right, and you don't have a lot of, uh, power to control your own destiny at the very least you can make the bastards pay by drawing them that way you know <laughs> and um it's like historical it's textual it's gorgeous i mean people like actually know how to paint there and it is everywhere and it's right there with a bunch of you know people like just sitting on the curb drinking their medallias and a bunch of stray cats and people bearing salsa from their cars and art 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 all over all the fucking walls and for me i don't know that's 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 the way that art should be seen. It should be a part of life, um, not something that's that's you know walled away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Reva, um, well, just uh, for a moment, Molly. I've I've been looking at a lot of the work in Brother of the Brothers of Brother Brothers of brothers the Count. Brothers of the Count. Yes, Count the Brothers. Um, and I've seen a lot of uh, what I assume are, is influence of um, underground comics and even Mad Magazine. Oh yeah, 100%, yeah. Yeah, I've seen a lot of Mad, um, which I loved. I mean, I loved that work when I was a kid. And the sort of Ralph Steadman feeling of the way that you handle ink, it's just, it's like you brought it into the current era in such a great way because you're also, you have this eye of like a miniaturist too. I don't know how big these are, but it, there's something both monumental and intimate in the way that you draw. And yet you bring that language of like the um, unofficial, you know, figuration. I'm just, I was really impressed. So Thank you. yeah, it's, it's got just a hell of a lot of presence. So Thank you. You know, another thing that I, the whole golem idea kind of brings to mind is the idea of the artist as being a kind of a visionary. And one of the questions here, meaning the artist who uh, is able to see things that don't already exist, right? Is able to see, like you were saying, ask the questions rather than necessarily just represent reality as it exists. One of the questions is asking Molly about your work with uh, incorporating politics, leftist politics into your art, especially your work like with the video with Representative Ocasio-Cortez. Um, how is it that you, I mean, one of the things I loved about that video was I felt like, you know, I've obviously heard a lot about the Green New Deal and people talk about the Green New Deal, they talk about, climate crisis, they talk about what we're supposed to do. And that was in that in that animation, it was the first time I saw like someone who'd imagined us into what that would look like into the future. Um, do you see that as being one of the functions of like helping people see, like not just what's in front of them, but what can be? 
hundred percent. And so I, I am a leftist, right? I am a socialist. And uh, when I, um, if I was like a leftist and a socialist and I was a carpenter, I would probably, um, I don't know, be building barricades or stages or something. <laughs> if I was um, a leftist and a socialist and I was really good at engineering, I'd probably be making really cool banner drops. I mean, if I was a leftist and a socialist and I knew how to grow stuff as opposed to just kill plants, I would, you know, I'd have a farm that, that you know, that fed poor people, but like I, my skill is drawing. And so, um, a lot of times it's not, I'm not like, how can I incorporate leftist art into my politics? I leftist, I'm sorry, how can I incorporate leftist mm -hmm. politics into my art? It's, I'm like, how can my art actually be useful for a political struggle? Um, there's this book, um, it's like the only book of art criticism I like, because I, I hate art criticism usually, uh, by Ben Davies uh, called um, 99 Theses on Art and Class. And he uh, has a statement where he says that for him, the most, the best work of political art was Picasso's Garnica. And the reason that it was the best work of political art was that um, the price to see it in London was that you had to uh, bring a pair of boots that would be sent to the Spanish front to be worn by uh, the soldiers of the Republic that were fighting Franco's fascists. And that in the course of this art being shown, they had raised thousands of boots that were sent to the front. And I think like there's good art and bad art. I'm not one of those people that thinks, you know, all art has to be political. I think that that lend, lends to some pretty um, bad uh, poster art if you start going down that that route. But I do think that um, your art can be used for political struggles and you can kind of measure the utility of it. Now with, um, with working with AOC, yeah, that's what we were trying to do. You know, me and AOC and, and Naomi and, and Avi and the team, we wanted to take these ideas that everyone was saying were unrealistic, that you couldn't do them. They were like trivializing that the Republicans were trivializing them. They're making up stupid caricatures of them and show them in a way that like both was, um, you know, gorgeous and enticing, but also was related to the world as it currently is. It wasn't like some flying car, you know, Dubai with solar panels thing. Uh, that was why I set the last shot, um, not in like, you know, the glass walled future city. I set it in um, the Grand Concourse in the Bronx, just in a Grand Concourse with some more trees and solar panels and public transit. Yeah, yeah I thought I was, it was an amazing, amazing piece. Um, and. Uh, and I think I'll just end with the question to Riva um, that's uh, on the same theme. What is it that you want people through your book, through your art, um, through all of your work to see that they don't see already? Um, well, I'll kind of answer the question you asked a minute ago um, about where okay. I would want my art to be because I think that answers both things. Um, in a weird way, I want to be in the museums um, because if you look at the history of Western painting, it's still out there making us think that certain things are beautiful and this is how we should look and this is how, I mean, portraits, classical portraits don't just teach beauty, they teach comportment and behavior and power, how to signal power and all of these things that you can just trace immediately to movies and TV and contemporary photography. And so what I want is to have images, either my images or images like mine doing something similar to be in there, spaced in there, challenging in there so that you can see, you can see what's happening in a Western painting of you know, uh, the Renaissance. How, what are we being taught by a portrait from, you know, early 1700s, mid 1700s or something that's still uh, controlling us now? And so if I can have images of people whom I find beautiful, who I find powerful, who are not doing those things, um, I think that it helps us see the legacy that we're still living with. Um, that's telling us what kind of beauties, what kind of bodies we should be and we should want. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Riva. Thank you, Molly, for joining us. Thank you very much to our interpreters. 
um, and everyone who's, uh, who's um, attended here tonight. It was an amazing conversation. I really enjoyed it. Um, and everyone go out and buy Reba's book, Golem Girl, out now, and also Brothers of the Gun, an amazing book about the Syrian Civil War. So Thank you very much, Syrian Civil War. Um, and, uh, and thanks again to both of you. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It was an honor. It's really honored speaking to you, Riva. It's been completely a thrill. You are astonishing. <laughs> okay. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Mm -hmm.